What's up, everybody? TJ here. Real quick before we get started with the episode, I'm testing out a new feature called Fan Mail, which is where you can actually text me from the episode that you're listening to. So as you're listening to this, go over to the episode description and right there at the beginning, you're going to see some text that says, send me a text message. Go ahead, click that. Let me know what you think about the podcast so far. Let me know of any questions, concerns, anything you might have. I love to hear from you. So go ahead, hit that up. I'm excited to read your text and let's get started with the episode. Next time you read in a newspaper that a firefighter died of undisclosed causes, I want you to read into that. That firefighter might have taken his life or her life because fire departments don't want to admit that firefighters are killing themselves. Welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast, where we help build resilient and well-rounded firefighters. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Today, I'm joined by pretty much the guy who got me started in podcasting. He's the host of the Things We All Carry podcast. I was lucky enough to be a guest in that podcast, God, like a year or so ago. But most importantly, you've heard his voice before because he is a man who voiced the intro to all of our episodes. He is the wonderful, the awesome, the badass Brandon Stackpole. Stack, my brother, thank you so much for joining me today. My friend, thank you for having me. This is awesome. And I got to tell you, doing that intro was one of the toughest things I've ever done. I, I did that so many times. I got tired of saying it. And, and uh, I think the outtakes are better than the final product. Oh, they are. Yeah, I still have the majority of those files. And most of the time, I just spent laughing at you just cursing at the microphone. There were so many. And actually, it got to the point that I started kind of categorizing them. I'm like, this one's kind of playful. This one's kind of like serious <laughs> and it was a really really tough decision to pick one because you had so many of them that i just didn't know what to do so i mean well, when i finally I, I finally sent some over to you and then you 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 were so polite you were just like hey you know these are good but eh? <laughs> not at all what we want so well the way that it. i looked I like, at okay, it is i got it that that i didn't communicate well enough what i wanted and i i was kind of blaming myself for that but yeah, dude, that intro is awesome. I, I love it. Like I, I get so pumped whenever, you know, I hear my own episode that it, the the rock kicks in and then your voice comes on and then the, the episode starts. Like it still just gives me goosebumps because like this is so cool. Shut up. This will be this will be number 50 for me. And I'm still trying to convince myself I have a legit podcast. So <laughs> I, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're feeling. Yeah, you are going to be episode number 10 for us, which is a gigantic milestone. And this one's going to be kind of a crossover because we're recording it for kind of both podcasts and we're just going to go back and forth. It's going to be kind of like interview format, kind of like what you and I did when we sat down back in April of last year. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've, I've always talked about was, was I, one of my buddies, he's not even connected to the fire service. He he has his own podcast and he said, you, at some point you have to let people in on your own story. And I think we all sit back and we say, well, my story's not much of anything, so why would I want to do that? But I think episode 50 is probably a good spot to to talk about myself some and then share it with you and talk about you and see where we go. Yeah, by this point, your listeners have heard so much from you, but they don't know much about you. Right, because so. my goal is to stay out of the way when I interview people. Well, brother, this is what happens when you have a podcast. You have to, like, you have to show your face out there and be like, hello, this is me. This is who I am. Yeah, all the warts, scars, and, and everything included, so. Also, Josh is out on vacation, so on my end, this is just me by my lonesome talking to you. It's kind of weird because I can't look at him for help, and we'll see how it yeah, goes. Yeah, now you know how I feel. <laughs> oh, whatever, Mr. 50 episodes. <laughs> hey, listen, why don't you tell me a little bit about what inspired you to become a firefighter and, like, how you got started, how long you've been in, the usual question. Like, warm me up to your fire service career. Oh, what inspired me? Where did it start? Way back when. And I would love to say way back when, but it wasn't. I came into the fire service uh, late in life, actually pretty late in life. I was 44 when I went through the academy. Um, and I did that because, well, I, out of high school, I joined the Army, spent three years in the Army. And then I, uh, I got married, had kids, and we moved around quite a bit as the Army life does. Um, she was active duty for 20 years, and, and I was I was the spouse, and I did a lot of the child rearing and all of that. Um, 
we finally settled down in the Virginia area and I, I started to get a career, but it was with autistic kids and their families. Uh, my specialty and my schooling was, well, is still in uh, applied behavior analysis. So what I would do is I would go into the schools and workplaces and homes and I would observe all the behaviors that people wanted changed or increased or decreased or whatever. And I would kind of study what's feeding those behaviors. And once I developed a behavior plan, I would I would work on the behavior plan myself with the with the client. And then um, I would teach it to the, to their family or their work, pe the people working with them. And that was my job. So I wrote behavior plans and and, and worked with families and, and caregivers. Um, my kids graduated high school, moved on, and I decided I wanted to do something different. And I, in the Army, had been a medic, or not a medic, I'd been in the medical field. It was a um, orthopedic tech. It was what I was doing in the Army. And so it interested me and I had a buddy that I worked with at one of the schools, and he, he went into Fairfax County for, for firefighting, and, and I asked him about it. And, and I said, well, I'll never get in. He goes, nah, man, old as a, old as a category. Try it. And so I put my name in, and uh, and lo and behold, got hired in, in the county I work in, and uh, it's been ten years now. That's awesome, dude! Congrats. Yeah, so I'm I'm getting getting to the point where I feel like I'm too old to be doing it. That's that's the scary part, I think. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way too. It's mostly when we have like three, four, four runs after midnight. I'm like, oh god, I'm not made for this. Anymore. Oh yeah. Yeah, this whole this last tour was uh, there wasn't one night where we slept through. So um, um, I felt it after I felt that yesterday came home and took a nap. <laughs> yeah, dude, I did the same thing. I, I don't know how your nap was. Mine ended up being like a six hour long nap. I woke up at 7 p.m. Lost, confused. I was like, where am I? Who am I? What am I doing? Yeah, not a great feeling. Oh, it's the worst. Shift work is going to kill us one day. Oh, yeah. So that's interesting. I had no idea about, about your, your background with, um, with the behavioral side of things. And it sort of explains why you have such a keen eye for what you're doing with the Things We All Carry podcast, because you are focused heavily on the behaviors, the, the thoughts, the feelings, all of those things that go on in our minds and in our lives and how they affect us on and off the job. And we're definitely going to delve deeper into your podcast later on. And it's now, now I'm starting to build that picture, that, that, that solid picture of who you are and how you ended up doing, doing what you've been doing. It's, it's pretty awesome. All right. So 10 years, uh, that's yep. about, that's about years. the same time that I have. Where are you assigned now? And, and I mean, I know that you're not going to say who it is because I know you have an issue with your, um, what is it? The dinosaurs as, as we call them. Yeah. The dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah I, yeah, the, I, I just, the dinosaurs used, have, and the dinosaurs have an issue with me, so I really don't care. <laughs> I just call I mean, them. honestly, it is what it is at this point. They know how I feel about them. I know how they feel about me, and it's it's a very tense uh, truce, I would imagine, at this point. Um, I, my focus has shifted away from them because their mindset's not going to change. So my focus shifted to this mental health aspect and talking about it and exposing it and, and not letting people – not letting him sweep stuff under the rug about it. And so um, I would say it's a, it's a tense truce, but I really just shifted my focus away. I put myself out there. I, 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 what, what they got me for and what they, what they did the whole investigation for this whole, it was a bunch of the way they did it was bullshit. And it pisses me off that they brought my coworkers into my crew members in and put them through hell. I think it was bullshit. Um, what I did. Okay, sure. I told them right off the bat. Yep. I did that. And, but they still went ahead and, and did this, this fucking circus and and that 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 has soured me to the leadership uh forever in that department would you say that's one of the biggest challenges you face in your fire service career that was that was a challenge but i brought that on myself to be honest and so um you know deservedly so but um i think it could have been handled differently and i think that there was a there was a push to, to make a a bigger example out of me than was necessary because other people were starting to speak up and, and that scared them. Ah, uh, yeah. The good old fear that always gets right. Them. That's awesome. Yeah. So I would, I would say it was a challenge, but it was just kind of like, okay, it, in the sense of, was it a challenge or was it just a, okay, well, yeah, I did that. So let's wait and see what you want to, how do you want to slap me on the wrist? Let's, let's just get it over with. And, there, and it came and went and it you know, just went back to work. Yeah, and you're still there. You're still yeah. doing the thing. So now, um, 
when I started the, the, the podcast and Instagram, all the, all the bullshit, I was, I was riding on a, a heavy rescue, which in my County, a heavy rescue is, is, you know, the, the technical rescue, uh, piece. And, um, just recently I, I was, uh, I was shifted away from the heavy rescue to back onto a truck. So I'm now a, a truckie again and learning how to, uh, drag my knuckles and build those calluses back up. <laughs> so it's, it's it's a return to a to a role that I've I've played in the past and and um, it's another challenge. It's just uh, it's learning something again or or not learning it again, but relearning and um, trying to perfect that craft again. Yeah, especially because having been away from that for uh, however long you were in the rescue, you're basically a new person from how you were when you left. You just have to basically... yeah. The four years on a rescue, you, you tend to forget how to drive the aerial. <laughs> Is it a tiller or is it just a regular rear mount? Or yeah, it's just mount? a regular, no. just a regular rear mount. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I think we're going to buy two more for our county. Maybe three. I don't know. There's a lot of rumors, but I think the, the total is going to be two. Yeah, we always get the rumors of tillers, but I, I, I'd be very surprised if they ever get tillers. All right. So now let's talk about the podcast because i mean that's I, I can sit here and try to pick your brain about about the fire service but you've been in for 10 years spent time on a truck company on a heavy rescue and i mean we we, we all go through our careers and bouncing from station to station and, and assignment to assignment but you basically fire the opening volley when it comes to firefighter podcast and mental health and that like it was one of those things that it, it was very exciting to watch you from the beginning because i used to follow your other account the objectionables and you started asking for people to interview and it slowly slowly started gathering momentum and next thing you know boom like you didn't even do a hey this is me this is an early intro episode you'd like launched yourself out there were like five or six people that you already had in the chamber so well, that's funny because I, I i i launched by accident back in what was it june of last year i i, I launched by accident because i didn't know what the fuck i was doing um you and i were talking earlier before before you did the intro that that um i'm, I'm gonna pick your brain about technology because i'm, I'm old you know i've called myself out i'm old and i'm kind of a troglodyte coming to you and and I, I i need to get up to speed um back in june i i didn't know what you know a hosting site was you know i didn't know what it was and so i signed up for this hosting site and i i put five episodes on this hosting site just in my mind, I was thinking I was putting them to store them there just to let them sit until I was ready. I woke up one morning and, and one of the guys I know, he's actually, he used to be my captain at one of my old fire stations. He goes, Hey, um, just to let you know the the show's great, but you got to make some corrections on the, on the uh, graphics. And I said, well, what are you talking about? He goes, the shows. And I said, the shows aren't out, Marcus. He goes, no, they're out. And I said, no, they're not. And he goes, I listened to it this morning. They're out. And I, and I went, Oh shit. And so then I, I rushed to actually put something together to make it official that the shows were out. So I made a mistake and that's why the first five were dropped the way they were. Well, dude, you overcame with grace because everybody else was talking like, man, this guy, like he came out the gate swinging with five episodes. Like it was, it was incredible. And, and I was honored to be one of those, one of those first five along with my buddy Chris Monroe and um, it's like, it was so cool f watching it from inception to now you're reaching 50 episodes, which is, I mean, it's, it's wild. It's, um, it's such a cool, it's gotta be such a cool feeling to know that you've reached so many people and you've interviewed so many great people with their amazing stories. That's one, that's one of the reasons why we started ours is because everybody has a story to tell. And it doesn't matter who they are. Everybody wants to interview like the the chiefs and the authors and like the big wigs who run, you know, fire engineering, firehouse, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also so much awesome content from the people that we work with. Like the guys and gals on the floor next to us have just as much insight as that 40, 50 year old chief. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and the, you know, that kind of stems from one of my original ideas for a podcast. I wanted to just talk to like the everyday person on the street. I don't, it, you know, one of the examples was I was in Richmond for a concert one, 
one night and, and I was late to meet people and it was pouring down rain. I just wanted to get to my car, but it was pouring down rain. And, and here I was unprepared, no umbrella. And this homeless guy walks by and he's got an umbrella. And I was like, okay, I'm, I, I said, I got, I'll give you five bucks. If you just let me use your umbrella to walk across the street, I'll bring it right back. I wasn't even thinking because he's pushing a cart or not even pushing a cart. He just, he just has in his bag, everything that he owns. Right. He's not going to give me his umbrella for five bucks. It's, it's, it's priceless to him. So he said, I'll tell you what, I'll just walk with you. And so we walked, we walked across the street. It was a short walk, but I got kind of the gist of his story. And this is what I was talking about. Everyone has a story. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the homeless guy on the street or the fire chief of a department, you have a story. I want to hear it. Yeah. And you've gotten some good ones. Yeah. I've gotten lucky with some good stories. Um, some very impactful and powerful stories and very interesting and, and intricate and in depth that uh, have been in both enjoyable and painful to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. I, it probably took me a good six months to actually sit down and listen to the one that we recorded just because I kind of unloaded on you when we sat down. I, you, I had one of those episodes where I just like, I blacked out and then I came back to and I was like, oh my God, I've been talking for like an hour. What have I done? <laughs> We sat at a dining room table and talked for about 90 minutes. Yeah. 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 The whole time I was just playing with like with the electronics that you had, I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> but, um, well, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of a nerd and you nerded out on it. Oh, hardcore, man. Like that's <laughs> my ADD had to be tempered. And the only way I did that was by just sitting there and it was one of the recorders, like the one with the goofy microphones that are intertwined diagonally and i just kept picking oh, the up P, the p8 yeah that thing was nice and i like i kept holding it like it was a um one of those scanners like one of those barcode scanners that you pick up at the supermarket because that's kind of how it like how it felt so i was having all sorts of like weird like star trek star wars blaster fantasies it was kind of it was kind of goofy but um yeah like i going back to that episode it was it was rough i've only listened to it once and uh people have reached out and had comments, good and bad. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm like, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. I haven't, I haven't had the courage to, um, to go back and listen to it because I didn't want to revisit all that, all the trauma that I that I opened up to. But I am thankful that you gave me that opportunity because I was able to get that message out there to many, many more people than I could have on my own, without your. You know, I. I... I knew mental health had to be spoken about. I knew we had to shine a light on it. I knew we had to expose that, I don't know, for lack of a better word, the dirty little secrets that we all go through. Um, I didn't realize just how much it was needed and how much people needed to talk. Um, and, and not just needed to talk, but needed to know it was okay to talk. Yeah. I just, I didn't, I just didn't realize how much that was needed for someone to go. It's okay. Tell me. Because we are in that profession that's, you know, gung-ho, beat your chest. I'm not going to do anything about this. I'm just going to, you know, be a man and go home and do a shot about it and go to sleep. Which accomplishes nothing. <laughs> it's it's probably the most no. unhealthy thing that we can do. It happened. You couldn't change what happened. You are just part of that roller coaster ride. Might as well make the most out of it, but burying your head in the sand and drowning it in booze and prescription pills, not going to work. And and I've told the story, the origin story a couple of times, and I, I can tell it here. I mean, one day and a couple of years ago, I was, I was sitting at the house and and I get a, a text from somebody. I, for, I forget who the text was from, and I apologize to whoever sent it to me because I forget. And it was like, hey, did you see the guy in? in in Manassas who, who killed himself. And I said, no, I, what guy? He goes, another firefighter is a volunteer. It was a former volunteer who killed himself. And I was like, shit. Cause at that point he ended up being the fifth in our, the, the DMV region, the dis, you know, the district, Maryland or Virginia, that region, the fifth in a year to kill himself. And it was voluntary career it was rookie to seasoned firefighter. And that was the impetus. That was the decision. That was the time that I just said, no, something's got to be done. And I had to, I had to try and figure that was January. And I had to figure out how to tell it, how to speak about it, how to, how to delve into it. And it took till, well, I think you and I sat down in March or April. And it was then that I realized how, how important it was. Yeah. 
yeah, it's, I mean, it's an ailment that, that, uh, that's taking us out and we don't really cover it, right? We cover cancer, we cover all the heart conditions, but I, a friend of mine reached out and she's like, Hey, at some point, if you still want to talk about the center for excellence, let's, um, let's talk about it because somebody that she was there with like a firefighter from Tennessee, I think he recently took his own life as well. Like did everything right, went, got the help and still succumb to those demons, which is, it's just so soul crushing to know that we're doing something for it, but we are not doing enough if we are still having those issues. Yeah. And, and I don't know what happened to, to him specifically and, and what his situation was when he went home, but just because you go to the center of excellence doesn't mean it's magically over. Right. Right. Have you interviewed anybody who has spent time at the center for excellence? Oh yeah. A number of them. Uh, one of the guys I've gotten pretty close to and I consider a friend. I haven't, we haven't spoken in a bit, but he was, uh, he was early on in the episode. His name was Matt and he's, he's in a neighboring County and, and, uh, he was, uh, his story is pretty amazing. He was, he's a young guy who, who experienced, um, it, it, the, some of the things he experienced had to centered around pediatric death. And, uh, and we all know that any call with a, with a pediatric involved is, is traumatic, but when you just, when you have to run numerous pediatric death, it piles up pretty quickly. Yeah. And, uh, he spent his 30 plus days at the center of excellence and, um, uh, he came out and he's, he's just trying to pay it forward now. And he's just one of those guys who lights up a room when you, when you, when you see him. That's awesome. That's awesome. And your, your platform has given him that voice to be able to pay it forward, which. Yeah. He actually came in and spoke to my, to my crew at the station and gave his presentation and, and sat down and shared with, with my crew uh, one-on-one and, and I can't thank him enough for doing that. It's, it's, it's what he wants to do now. And, and, um, for him to come out and talk to us on his own time is was wonderful. So what, like, what is the biggest takeaway that that you want people to have from from listening to your podcast or multiple takeaways? I know it's kind of hard to nail down to just mm. one thing. I kind of think I know what it's going to be, but why don't you tell us? I was going to. I think I don't want to use my tagline necessarily, um, so I'll just kind of paraphrase that. You know. What we all experience is 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 unique to us. So the traumas that you experience are unique to you, but the traumas I experience are new, unique to me. But but our stories are, can be universal. So how you recover, how you went through everything, can be universal as to it can it we can extrapolate that out across the fire service. Anybody who because your story centered around Nate's death, and and how you guys fought through that and recovered from that can be extrapolated out to anybody who's had an LODD in their department. Right. Right. And I actually, I just interviewed a gentleman this afternoon, right before we get on the phone who talked about, um, they responded to a call where the guy fell and, and, uh, when they got on scene, they rolled him over, you know, appropriate precautions. They rolled him over to find that it was a, a Lieutenant on a, on the shift that, that was going to relieve them. Oh God. And, um, when they showed back up to the fire station, his story was almost exact to what your story was. That wasn't my firehouse anymore. Right, right. Oh, that's and I'm like, okay, worst. so this is a guy. This is a guy in Rhode Island, or excuse me, not Rhode Island, in, in Eastern Shore, of Maryland, and you're in Maryland as well, but but a, a state apart because he's on the Eastern Shore mm-hmm. and you're in, in Howard County, so it's a it's a state apart, and it's the same experience. You know, the the division chiefs, the the deputy chiefs, the fire chiefs, they all come in and and. Now all of a sudden you've got your fire chief and you're sitting in your spot at the table and you're like, motherfucker, just move, right. just leave, just give us our space and let us deal with this the way we deal with it. And but I get it, I understand it. They feel like they have to do something. So I think that it's universal. What we go through is universal. Um, everyone is going through some aspect of it. There's some level of it with all of us. Now we don't all react to it the same way, and we all don't react to the same calls the same way. Um, I don't know. I, I know what calls hit me the hardest and, and, and I know what, you know, well, I'm learning my new crew, but my old crew, I knew what calls hit them the hardest. So I knew that if we're going to a pediatric call, I'm not, I'm going to go in as opposed to somebody else on my crew because it just hits them differently because they have kids of, of that age. Right. But 
if we're responding to a hanging, I don't want to go in. I've seen enough hangings. I don't want to do them again. That those are the ones that stick in my head. You know, I, I, we, we ran through a spate of hangings that I've got enough, I've got enough memories of bloated faces and I don't need any more. So, so it, it's, it's, it's interesting how the traumas are, are the same, but the reactions to them vary and, 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 and they hit us differently. And that's what you're trying to get out there through your, through your platform is that we can all learn from that universal pain, that, that, that trauma that we go through because we are not alone in experiencing it. And it's important to take the people who dealt with it and I don't want to say came out better on the other side, but who were able to, to manage it and to cope with it in a healthy way, in a growth focused way, it's important to get those people to tell their story so that the others who are going through the same trauma don't fall into that dark hole of despair and alcohol and drugs and hopelessness. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the biggest things I can take away from, no, I'm not the biggest, but one of the things I learned in this show was that PTSD is one thing, but I like to talk about the, the post-traumatic growth more than anything. It's, it's what are you taking now and how are you changing and how are you making it better from this point on? And until I started the show, honestly, I didn't know what post-traumatic growth was. I'd never heard the term. So can you encapsulate it in like a sentence? Exactly that. It's, it's taking that experience and, and learning from it and learning how to react from it and making your life better because of it. That's how I would paraphrase a, a definition for post-traumatic growth. I mean, I'll take that. You're you're the dude with with the behavioral background, so that's your word is gospel, as far as I know. Well, that's dangerous, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll be saying that when I find myself at, myself at headquarters, be like, well, I mean, Stack's word is is gospel. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly yeah. why I'm here. Yeah, exactly. What have been some of the most memorable episodes that you've had on on your podcast? And well, you don't you have to say him, me, obviously. You mentioned him right off the bat, Chris. I mean, that's I don't some sometimes I regret that Chris was number one because his story is just so powerful. Like the shit that he went through, any one thing that he talks about could have waylaid anybody. But this guy went through multiple of them where there was just like you, you just you hear a story and you're like, what? I can't, I can't fathom one of them, not five, six, seven of them that this guy went through and that he's, he's made some changes in his life and he's, he's thriving. And it's just, it was, it's just a wonderful story. That being said, it's like, it's like asking me to pick a, it's like asking a mom to pick their favorite kid, you know, <laughs> who, who do you choose? Cause, he, Cause each story is impactful in its own way. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I can tell you stories of like yours that's dealing with LODD and, and, I can tell you a story of, of my coworker, Jose, who, who talks about coming over as an illegal alien and being, having, having to be sneak, snuck over the border, basically, and, and how he dealt with life after that. Um, I can tell you the, the uh, childhood abuse that led to, you know, that wasn't remembered until you're on a call and, and, it, and it's brought out because of, of what you see on, on the job. And then you, then you have this flashback about, holy fuck, that was me. And you, you blocked it all until you were on the job and you, and you experienced something. And it just, it goes on and on. I mean, everybody has this story that when you hear it, you're just like, Jesus Christ. It, the, the thing that's amazed me about this show is that every episode I've done, I've taken a piece and I went, that's me. There's a piece of me in every episode. And, it, and that's what reminds me about that universality of this show. There's something of me in every one of these stories and experiences. I've experienced something that they've talked about. That's, that's powerful. Like, dude, and like going back to Chris, awesome human being, like one of the nicest people, like legitimately, genuinely nicest people I ever met. We, uh, we met at CDP at the Center for Domestic Preparedness in Alabama when I was a psychopath about hazmat. Back in, God, like back in 2017. By the way, saying a psychopath about hazmat is redundant. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I got kicked off the special ops team recently, so now I'm back to ordinary operations. I'm back to oh, you too. Um, yeah, you too, huh? All right, good. Yeah, I'll send you one of the ordinary operation stickers. Yeah, please. It's um, so I'm 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 a recovering so person, <laughs> but I, dude, I mean, and what I tell people, they're like, "Don't you miss a team?" I was like, "I miss the people that I have met throughout all those adventures and misadventures." And Chris is one of those, and we we've kept in touch. I mean, hell, he even placed an order for leather the other day. Nice. And like that episode of his, it was like it was it was gutting. I'm sitting there and I'm listening to it. Mm. And I was like, I can't believe I didn't know this. Like I consider right. this dude a friend of mine, and all this I had no clue about. He even warned me. He's like, bro, do not change your mind about me or do. He's like, just I'm just warning you. Like it's a lot of heavy stuff. And I'm like, dude, it, it is I'm, a... I'm sure it's going to be fine. And he's like, no, I'm trust me. And yeah, I like I was floored because the dude, for lack of a better term, he hides it so well. <laughs> it was um, I um I played Chris's episode for my crew. Uh, oh, I don't know when it was. Jesus, maybe July. No, no, it, it was before the show even dropped. It was, this was before the show before the show was official. I had recorded you. I had recorded Chris um, and a few others, and I wanted to do a presentation. And I said, you know what? Never mind. I'm just going to play Chris's episode and see see how they react to it. Because I wanted to, I go make call it market research. How about that? Yeah. Makes and uh, so I played Chris's episode for my crew. And I'm telling you, when um, when the hour and plus, I don't know how many minutes Chris's episode is, but when that time was up, and I I pushed stop. I looked around the room and I don't think there was a mouth that was closed and they were just, they were, they were, they were dumbfounded for, for that's about the only word I can come up with. They were stunned at what, what he had, had gone through and spoken about. And that leads me to something that I've been wanting to talk to you about for a long time, because let's rewind back to when I left your house, I was exhausted. Like I, I drove home like an hour and a half and I was just, beat and I slept the whole rest of the day you are left with the audio files with having to edit with having to publish mm. in some in some episodes some content that is very 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 heavy how do you deal with that like what do you do you have a routine of you, you got to be able to decompress right like how, how do you go through it I wish I had an official answer. I wish I had like, okay, this is what I do, but I'm going to, I'll be I don't know, brutally honest. It, it, sometimes it sucks. Um, those first, especially those first episodes, cause I was trying to get it so right. I was trying to learn and I was trying to get it so right. And I was editing down to a dime. You know, I just, I, I wanted, I wanted every little mishap out of there. Um, they still sound like shit by the way. So don't let me preface it with that. Um, but, I, I listened to those, like I listened to Chris's episode. Mm, shit. I, I have probably listened to Chris's episode 20 times, you know, from the raw audio to, to the finished product. I probably heard it at least 20 times. And that's a lot to put on somebody that, that, and then you, you, you take that and you think, okay, well, I listened to your episode probably 15 to 16 times because it was the same time frame, you know? Um, and nowadays it's probably down to four or five times I listen to an episode before it, before it's released. And then I, and then even then sometimes I'll, after release, I'll, I'll, I'll fire it up Wednesday morning just to make sure it sounds the way I think it's supposed to sound when it's the finished product. Um, I found that I, um, I talked to a therapist, so that's something that I took upon myself last year for the first time in my life. And, and, that's kind of another reason why I do the show because I realize how important that that aspect of life was. Even if you're not a firefighter or a first responder, the therapy is there and, and it, and it works. It helps, you know? Um, I talk to friends, I talk to coworkers, um, work out, read. Um, there's a lot of stuff I do just to, to, to focus away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Because my, after- my, my concern is more towards you guys. Because one thing I didn't expect, and maybe I was foolish for not expecting it, I did not expect the, 
I don't want to say fandom, but there's this. Um, I've spoken to a few of the few of the guests who have said, and every time someone listens to it, they reach out and say, "I had no idea," and they and they want to talk to me about it. And I don't really want to talk about it. I, I talked about it on the show, and that's kind of where I want to leave it. But uh, but these people reach out to me, and every time I see someone, the first time after they listen to my show, they want to talk about it. And I didn't take into account how life would be for you guys after you went on the show. Yeah, that um, that part gets hard when when people reach out and they have questions they want you to like I had a few who reached out and said hey can you tell me more about what you, like this part of the episode <laughs> and I had to politely say listen I haven't even sat down to deal with it and I'm just not ready like it's one of those things that I don't really want to revisit just yet because it, and I told you, like it was, it was gonna basically tear open that wound again. And it's, yeah, it gets, it gets rough. I can only imagine for for some of the other folks who have gone through through some very tough experiences, just how exhausting it is. Yeah, and like I said, I did, I didn't take into account into account at all how that would be for for people sharing. So it's, uh... dude, we should set up a group for like all the guests to just kind of talk about things, just kind of go there and be like decompress and just chat. Right. Yeah. Do it like a little discord group or something. <laughs> Dude, discord <laughs> reminds me so much of like the old timey Yahoo chats. Or oh, like it the, does. They, oh, it, you get into like a big server and it's just mayhem. It is pandemonium. You're trying to read one line and by the time you get three words in, the line is like halfway up your screen. You're like, exactly. You're, you're jumping headfirst into a raging river. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it can be a cesspool. Yeah, that too. That part too. <laughs> so a lot of work for the podcast, right? A lot of work lining these people up, recording with them, editing, launching. How on earth do you balance that with your schedule and with just your life? Ah, life is chaotic, man. Um, I think that's that's a theme that's been through the show as well is is this chaos that we live in as first responders. And not only do we live in it, we kind of thrive on it. We kind of search it out, right? Um, the calm kind of scares most of us. Um, and I'm just as guilty of that as as the next first responder, firefighter, cop, military, whatever you want to say. I'm just as guilty of that. I I don't like the calm. I don't like I don't like sitting still in my own shit. If for you know, I just don't like it. Um, so I probably don't do as good a job with with that. Um, I don't. Know, I probably don't do as good a job with that as I should. Um, I just lost my train of thought, so I apologize. Um, the chaos that we go through and and yeah, hating. So calm. the chaos, you kind of kind of thrive off of it and and. I don't know. I, I, I recently, for the last year and a half, I, I stayed away from some of my favorite hobbies. So reading has, has, has historically been one of my favorite things. Um, cycling has been one of my favorite things. For the last year and a half, two years, I, I kind of drop, let those things drop. And just recently, I've made a very concerted effort to, to pick them up again and say, okay, no, I need to take charge of my life. Um, I'm, I'm going through a divorce. Uh, it's that's something that's been going on for for a long time um so that that was chaotic and that was that is chaotic still um you know it's funny you, you do a show like this and people start to look at you as like this subject matter expert I'm, and i'm like no i'm not an expert i'm i'm just as fucked up as everybody else so i i'm i'm nothing to hold up as a as a prime example i just give a platform for people to share their story um i'm not an angel i'm not a I'm not someone that, that should be applauded for the way I live my life. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to learn how to live my life as, as a decent human being. Um, and so that's just something that the chaos and, and staying on top of everything, it's just something that I'm trying to learn how to deal with. I've, like I said, I, I do have chaos. I, I have, I've just recently been transferred. I'm going through a divorce. Uh, my mom for the last three and a half years has been dealing with stage four lung cancer. She's just recently been placed in hospice. Um, I'm trying to do the show and trying to work this job. I'm trying to, trying to stay in shape. I'm trying to, you know, trying to, sometimes it's like, um, it's treading water and you can see that beach and I'm, it, it's, 
sometimes I'm trying to convince myself that first of all, a I can swim, or just put your fucking feet down and you can walk onto that shore. But sometimes it's just not that easy. As you well know, I'm, I'm a I'm a huge advocate for other for alternative medicines. So <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about that. Might as well just dive into it head first because that's landed you in some hot water and. Um, Virginia has had a couple wins in that front recently, so just tell me more. Virginia's had wins. Uh, well, you know, a few years ago we had wins. Now that now that the, the Republican Party is is running the state house, it's not so much wins anymore. Um, unfortunately, they've denied the 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 right to um, buy recreationally. So marijuana is is legal in the state of Virginia, and it has very pretty much some strict stipulations on how and where you can use it and how much you can have um you pretty much have to be in your house to use it and 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 you can only have a certain amount on you at the at one time uh medical marijuana is legal so you can buy medical marijuana from dispensaries but you can't buy anything recreational in virginia and 2024 was supposed to be that year if and again i'm now i'm, I'm talking i'm speaking off the cuff so if I get this wrong, I apologize to all of you who uh, know much better than I do. Um, we were hoping to get it early this year, but it was shot down twice in the in the uh, in the house this year. So we're not going to get meta, we're not going to get recreational sale this year. And so it's weird how they they say, yeah, you can use it, but mm, we're not going to give you a way to buy it. So there's still a way to to, to I don't know to fill the coffers or, or maybe fill the jails. You know, not to get too political, um, you know. My as soon as as soon as uh, recreational was legal in Virginia, I, and that's a that's a celebration. But we need sales to be legal. Um, I think it's time to move on. I, I'm a big proponent of just legalizing drugs. Um, I don't think that that if heroin was available today, I'm not going to turn around and want to try heroin. It's it's that's a personal choice, and what I put in my body is what I put in my body. Nobody should have the right to tell me what I can and can't do with that. Um, I understand that we shouldn't be under the influence of work, and that's a responsibility thing, but there are other laws in place to take care of that. Hey guys, real quick, just wanted to ask a huge, huge favor. As I'm sure the majority of you know, we've been posting like crazy on Instagram and TikTok, and we're slowly moving on to other platforms like Facebook and YouTube. So in the time being, if you could just go ahead and head to either Instagram or TikTok, just share the episodes, share the little blurbs that we put out there. Just tell all your friends about them. It would mean the world to us. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah. So in my in my county, we had a county attorney who refused to fire a firefighter for testing positive for cannabis on his um, physical and because of that, there's there's a there's a cre there's a crack in the door for use in the county. However, there's still a battle in some aspects. There's, it's very gray on uh, what would happen if you got into an accident and you had THC in your system, even if you're not under the influence. So there's no answer to what would happen there. Um, and then also, if you report it during your physical, there the doctor is uh, adamantly against it, and he claims that he's going to send you to a cardiologist your own cardiologist to have them sign off on you to clear you back to duty. Well, no cardiologist is going to do that necessarily just because of the, the cannabis use. So it's a, it's a, yeah, you can use it, but don't, don't tell anybody you're using it. So there's, there's a lot of gray area still. And, and it's ridiculous because and science is showing that there's a lot of benefit to, to THC and, and I'm, um, I don't want to stop there. I mean, I am a, I'm a proponent of, of psychedelics for, for mental health. And so why can't we use what's best for our mental health? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think we go back to those dinosaurs we were talking about before who the Reagan era, the dare era, who were almost indoctrinated of like, you know, drugs are bad and K and yeah, okay. anything yeah. that, comes from the ground that is seen as that gateway drug. I went, dude, I went to Catholic school. They told us, like, you know, if you eat so much as look as marijuana within two years, you're going to be shooting up heroin in a back alley. And, you know, you're like a kid and you're terrified by this. I'm like, I, I don't belong in an alley. I'm like, that sounds pretty terrifying. <laughs> but um, it, it takes... Well, there's a, there's a really interesting book out that I don't know if, if many people have read. It's by um, a guy called 
his name is Dr. Carl Hart, and it's called Drug Use for Grown Ups. And uh, it's it's kind of eye opening from what he talks about because he's an advocate for for using the right drugs at the right time. And and this is a this is a professor. Um, he is a he's a tenured professor uh, of psychology and psychiatry psychiatry at Columbia, and um, he's an advocate for for open drug use. I mean, he he he'll tell you that he knows that a certain amount of heroin at the right time will help him present a better present his 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 information better a couple of days down the road. It's a really good book to read. It's a it'll open some eyes. Maybe it won't change minds, but it'll open some eyes. Okay, so psychedelics, um, that's, I think that's going to be the, that new frontier that, that we're going to be dealing with, hopefully in our lifetimes. I know Tim Ferriss has been dumping millions into, mm -hmm. you know, basically being an angel investor for, for companies and for, um, for studies that aim to kind of like lift the fog of what psychedelics do. Because again, I think we're all still, you, you think psychedelics, people are going to think mushrooms, LSD, you know, they're thinking about the sixties hippies, you know, just people completely blitzed out of their minds doing God knows what dancing naked in the field type thing. But there's been a lot of research done in the past few years that points to the psychedelics and, you know, THC as well is, as, as being able to not just help cope with trauma and with that post-traumatic stress and the multitude of, of mental illnesses that we go through, but not just deal with it, but kind of like reverse it and, and quote unquote, fix it, if you will, if there's such a, such an overarching term. I would, I would love to speak on this as a professional or, or as an expert, but I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on psychedelics. I just know what I've read in books and, and, uh, between mushrooms, LSD, ayahuasca, ibogaine, and, and I'll throw ketamine in there, though I know technically it's not a, it's not a hallucinogenic. Um, those are very therapeutic drugs and, and why not find a way to harness that for, for anybody, not just first responders, but anybody. Right. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's some evidence that shows that Ibogaine will um, not only fi fix some emotional pain, but fix actual physical pain. So w why wouldn't we look at that? I and mean, we're talking special forces in our own military use these, these drugs uh, as a way to, to, to uh, fix themselves, quote unquote. <laughs> I think we're just waiting for the, the pharmaceutical companies to see the to to project those profits and then somehow it's all going to be legalized oh yeah i mean we're definitely i mean you you look around ketamine is legal in all 50 states but you're going to use it in a in a you know, in a controlled controlled setting in a therapeutic setting and and mind you i'm also saying that that i began ayahuasca I, I don't think you should just go out and, and use it you know just go out and get get it and use it on your own i think there needs to be some sort of direction to it Oh yeah, absolutely. Like that's it's, when you're dealing with mind bending stuff, you, you need to be in the right place with the right people with the right support system, because I mean, hell, all you have to do is, is go online and Google stories about bad trips. And they're not just like, Oh, I had a bad time. It's like my brain damn near got fried is what some of these people say. Yeah. And I think that goes back to knowing what you're ingesting, first of all, and, and setting yourself up for success. You know, if, if your head's not right to begin with, know, it's probably not the best day to use mushrooms. <laughs> right. It's not going to be a fix all. It's not going to be a panacea. That's just going to suddenly make all your stuff go away. Yeah. It'll put a smile on your face for a good few hours, but that, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> so let's go back to the fire service in okay stacks world right in your perfect world you get to sandbox your fire service however you want it when it comes to mental health what would you have in place mm. what would i have in place well first of all i'm a huge advocate for know your people um Know, know your people to the point of, you know, when something's off. And I don't think leaders do that enough. I think that, and I'm speaking, I don't, I can't go universally because I don't spend a lot of time in other fire departments. I know what my department is like. 
Um, we have a lot of inexperience in senior positions. And I think the inexperience is not just fire, but it's also people. You got to learn to, to interact with your people. You got to, you have to know when something is wrong. You, you have to know, you have to notice the, the small changes. You have to, you have to have conversations. You have to, um, flesh out what's going on in someone's life. Um, from there, if, if something happens on a call, I think that if it's a traumatic call and again, I know that trauma hits people differently. And I said at the beginning of the show, it's, it's all about how we react to trauma, but we all know, we all know what we would call those stereotypical traumatic calls. So a pediatric death. How about that? We'll, we'll, we'll throw that one out there because that's probably the one that's going to affect everybody. So you do a CPR on a, on a, on an infant and the infant doesn't survive. What do you do after that? I think that we have to start to reframe these things as mental injuries. And from a mental injury, you got to figure out what's the best way to rehab that mental injury. And I would say that the, the worst way to rehab it is to send them right back out into the field to run another call. So how do you prevent that? I, you know, let's backfill a position. Let's give them some time off. Let's bring in some counselors. Let's let them find their way that is therapeutic to, to recover and, and come back to some, I don't know, some, some center. How about that? Um, and that goes back to everything that goes back to talk therapy, to psychedelics, to whatever you name it, whatever works for a person, let's find out what works and let's get them back to where they're ready to go again. They're, they're the best that they can be on the job. Um, I think that sleep, mental health, and, um, actually, I'm going to go with nutrition and fitness are the biggest things that we need to, to work on in fire service. We're really good at drilling. Mo well, most of us are good at drilling and, and training and, and getting the, you know, how to, how to, how to pull a hose line and how to get a layout and, and, you know, how to take a door or how to, how to stabilize a car or cut a car. We're, we're good at that. Cause that's the fun shit. We do that a lot. It's not so fun to say, Hey, let's not have tater tots for dinner. Yeah. You know, that's, that's boring, but it, it, that affects everything. Yeah. That's, we do that even more than we drill, right? We, we have hopefully at least three meals a day over the right. span of our career. That's, that's a lot. And if you're not optimizing for that, you're, you're setting yourself up for a really, really bad time. There's some things we can't change in the fire service. We can't change the calls in the middle of the night. We can't change that. We have to be there in the middle of the night. We can't change you know, the, the pressures and the traumas we're going to experience. We just can't because the nature of the job is that we do that. We can change how we react to it and we can, re we can change how we treat people after they experience it. And so to, to, to lead to longer and healthier careers, we have to do that and not just careers, but life after your career. Yeah. I think that's key. We, we've all seen those soul crushing stories of the dudes who retire after 30, 40 years and they drop dead like a week later. And right. You're like, man, the whole point is to be able to live like almost as long as you were working, right? Make, make that pension work for you. Make that retirement do, do good things for you and not just end on that note. Well, and it's, that actually brings up a whole nother subject because it's something I've talked to with, uh, and uh, you probably listened to a show, James Gearing, um, uh, behind the shield. Yeah. Behind the shield. Um, he and I have talked a couple of times. I, he was on my show. I was on his show and we've talked outside of the show about, you know, how do we, how do we approach retirement now? At what point do we say, okay, our retirement system is broken, right? So you might not be cut out for 20 years. The guy next to you might be cut out for 35 years. I don't know. But if you're not cut out for 20 years, why are you going to sit here and just live for a pension? Um, we, we have to figure out how to keep people healthy. And when we can't keep people healthy as firefighters, how do we still support them to, to leave the fire service and not feel like they've lost those years? Yeah. So that's another topic that, that I, I'm mulling over in my head. I'm kind of chewing it a little bit and I'm not sure how you do it. Yeah. It's on my end. It, 
I keep going back to the stories of the guys who dropped dead a week later because, and also going back to what you said about knowing your people, right? When we are near those folks, when we are near our people, we can tell, right? We pay attention to them. We know if they're doing well today, if they're not doing so hot today. But then when they retire, like that support system is gone. And it's mm. it's really scary having some of like those role models and, and those giants in the fire service. At first, when, when you're new, you look at them you're like, yeah, they earned it. This is so great. They're going to go off and, and live an adventurous life. They, they pay their dues, if you will. And as I spend more time in the fire service, I realize we just took their routine, their support system, their family, for a lot of them, their identity in literally like a snap of the finger, right? Overnight, hell, like the county shuts off our email at midnight on the last yeah. day of our retirement. So many people like wake up, you know, seven hours later because that's when the shift ends and the county's already slowly kicked them out of everything. And that's... I, I can... I can relate to that in a way. Um, I told you, you know, for the last, I don't know, for the last two and a half, what well, shit, for the last three and a half years, I've been going through a lot of shit in my life. And it's something that I've learned to kind of deal with. And I've, I finally started talking to a therapist about it. But before that, my crew was my was my bastion of, of whatever support. They knew what was going on. They checked in with me. Um they would sit down and say, Hey, you know, how are you today? Um, I had one, one coworker who's, who's definitely one of my best friends now he, who, who will force me to talk. He's the one that, that got me started on this, this whole talking thing. As I, as I say, um, uh, he, you know, now, even nowadays he'll sit down beside me and go, all right, so what's going on. And, and I know that it's time to just kind of open up and let it go. Um, it, it, those guys are my crew for some of them for, for four, four and a half years, you know, some of them for two years. Um, and they knew they were in tune with what was going on with me. They knew that I was going through some shit on the outside. They knew that, that my marriage was falling apart. They knew that my mom was dying. Um, you know, to be transferred from that was like, okay, well, there goes that support system. What the fuck do I do now? Right. So that's what I mean by, uh, being in tune with your people. Think of your people. Think of what they're going through, and don't, don't, don't just pull that out from under them. Right, like it might that transfer might look might look so good on paper, but in reality, that's could be almost a death sentence for somebody whose entire support system is based around that station and that crew. Right. Yeah, and and it, you know, it it. it it was it was jarring and it was it was unfortunate, um, and that has nothing to do with the crew that I'm working with now because I've got some good guys on my crew right now, and and we'll learn to be that that crew, that family that we all need to be to to thrive and survive in the fire service. But that crew that I just left was the best crew I'd ever had, you know, from from the bottom from fire service to to personal life, they were some of the best people I've ever met, and so to have that yanked out was painful. And, and I, and I put that on the people who made that decision. Um, they felt that, that there was a gap to be filled and, and they just, they needed a body there. And, and that body was that, that body just happened to be me this time. Dude, that reminds me of an email that we got probably four or five years ago from a higher up. And uh, it was very cryptic, but it basically said, Hey, we have a lot of opportunities in this County. We have a lot of stations and places where people can go and and kind of like hone their skill so we're going to be moving a lot of people here in the coming months just so they can experience the world like it, it, it was it came out of nowhere there was no no nothing to instigate it it was completely unannounced and if you could have been graphing the morale over time in our department it just nosedived at that point Mm -hmm. because you're looking at your crew and being like, this might be mm -hmm. the last time that I get to work with this crew. You're taking so much institutional knowledge away from one spot that it's, um, I think it's detrimental for operations, not to mention horrible for the mental well-being of our people. Right. I mean, we spend 24 hours at a time with these people. They're our family. Yeah. 
Yeah. They're 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 another family. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Good and bad. Like we 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 have to push through it because we can't really. Ch I mean, we could change that if we transfer, but that's that's kind of a quitter's attitude. Right. Exactly. And w my county, we transfer. We do transfers quite often. That's unfortunate. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, and and you can go from from what you think is the best job in, of your career to. And, and I'm not saying this is what I did now because it's not at all what I did now, but you can go from one of the most active and best jobs you've, you've had in the fire service to to a, a station that runs no calls and, and the crew scatters when, when the day starts and you don't see anybody for, for hours on end. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't, it's it's inexplicable to be honest with you. It's funny. We, the, I feel like our entire fire service experience is just fits all in one mold because that resonates with me. There's going to be somebody out there who's like, yeah, I know we have those stations that people just disappear at eight in the morning. Like it's, it's almost comical how almost identical all our stories are. Yeah. And that goes and circles right back to what I was saying about trauma being individual, but everything being universal at the same time. And also on the topic of trauma, dude, I, been meaning to but congrats i'm very proud of you for for actually reaching out and getting that help and and going to therapy i think i talked about that on on my episode that i've been seeing mine for jesus christ like almost 10 years now and uh, yeah you know the funny part about that and and um if i leave the fire service I, I lose that therapist because she's part of the she's part of the county and that's it that's so that connection i made here will be severed because it, it's part of the county right yeah. God, that's rough. Well, luckily that she's helped me quite a bit. She's opened my eyes to, to quite a bit of stuff. And, and yep. I, like anything, like anybody else in this, in this game, none of this is strictly fire department trauma. Right. You know, my shit started way back when say, Oh, I'll call it kindergarten, you know, and it all stems from family stuff. It all stems from, from interactions with, with my father and, and, and that's it, many situations, but I didn't recognize it until, until last year into this year. So I, I had no idea, basically it, it was, it was the, the dots had to be connected for me. And once she led me down that path, it was, Oh, wait a second. Now I see it. Wait a second. I'm still reacting from a five-year-old. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, dude, it's so insane how those interactions early on in our lives like the repercussions it's they're they're wild it's that that ripple effect you throw a boulder into a lake and it just ripples and ripples and ripples and ripples yeah it does it's it's and then you add everything else onto it all the new stuff just compounds as as you know and, and all the analogies are out there the, the water in a glass to, you know the, the the files in a cabinet the books on the shelf whatever you want to call it as soon as they start to fill up, something's got to spill over and it's got to go somewhere. Yeah. Well, we have been talking a little bit about the past. Let's turn and look at the future, right? <laughs> What's okay. in store for the things we all carry? That's a good question. I was just talking to my buddy today. Well, a couple of brief texts back and forth about, hey, what, 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 how do I take this to the, to the next level? And so I'm, I'm looking at some things. Um, and so I've been playing with some ideas of, of kind of a, a peer support, um, component of, of, all right, you want to talk, let's talk. I'm not a professional, but let's, let's, let's set up some time where, where people can, can call in or, or can, can have some tech support. And again, I'm not a professional, but peer support is something that, that I think we've all learned doing this. I, um, and so I, I'm trying to figure out where I can take it and how I can use it, um, at one point. I was considering a presentation on mental health and it's still in the works, something that, that I would like to present to people, maybe departments or, or fire stations and, and uh, kind of make them aware of what's out there. You know, first of all, what is, what is PTS? What is trauma? What is this? What is that? And, and how do you do this? And how do you do that? And, and, and where we go, what resources are available and just kind of open that conversation um, everywhere. Um, so the podcast, I, I want to grow it. Um, I just, you know, that's part part of why you and I need to sit down. Um, you're you're better at that than I am. You're, you uh, you have a bigger brain in your head than I do. Oh, stop um, it! Fire service, uh, the fire service is going to come to an end pretty quickly here. Uh, 
I, I've decided that that this body of mine is 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 more important than um, running a fire every few months. You know, the it, fires fires come and go. Uh, it's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been a challenge, but uh, I want to I want to live a long time, and this job does not lend itself to living a long time. Uh, between our gear, our sleep, our nutrition, uh, whatever you name it, this job doesn't lend itself to to a long life. Um, you don't find many old retired firefighters, um, and I know there are going to be people out there. Oh, no, 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 there are, but that's okay. But I just want to make sure that I live my life to the fullest for the longest I can, and this job doesn't lend itself to that. And so that decision has been made. It's just a matter of when do I pull the trigger. I'm not sure. It, it won't, it won't be long. So, um, that's in the works where it goes. I'm not sure. Okay. That's, um, that cover my next question. I was going to ask you about legacy, but I think that setting up for helping out firefighters as, as a peer is, um, a pretty solid legacy. And if you're asking legacy for the podcast, the legacy for the podcast is that we opened a conversation and, and we forced, we forced departments and, and people to, to think and to talk and to expose the, the, the dirty little secrets, the, you know, the, when you, next time you read in a newspaper that uh, the firefighter died of undisclosed, you know, causes, I want you to read into that, that that firefighter might have taken his life or her life because fire departments don't want to admit that, that firefighters are killing themselves. Um, it's just not what they want you to know about. And, and we're dying at our own hand at a faster pace than we're dying from fires. Yeah. And the fires are supposed to be the dangerous part. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're the dangerous part. Um, I'm sitting over here thinking I'm just rambling on and making no sense whatsoever. So, brother, so. if that's your rambling, I am terrified to see what your like coherent thoughts would be. I'm terrified too because I don't know if I ever have coherent thoughts. <laughs> then my ADHD takes over quite often. You know, I've, I've talked to you about oh it. Oh my god, yeah, it's impossible to get a hold of you. Like, <laughs> I'll be talking to Josh. I was like, hey, I got to sign a life from Stack, but we might be in the dark for like next month again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're the only one that thinks that. There's a lot of people that think, oh, sign a life. He is alive. That's the good news. So, right, right. I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to I'm going to close because because this is also my show. I'm going to give you my last two questions and they got to be different from the last time. Dude, if it's a book again, I'm going to be so mad at you because you ambushed me with that I question. Don't, I don't give a shit if you're mad at me. So because we probably won't talk again for another 30 days. You know me. <laughs> Think what, what's something else you carry every day? Because for your audience who might not have listened to my show, um, what I like to do is I like to ask everybody for an everyday carry something that that this person carries on them. And if you leave the house without, you feel naked. The reason I do it is because I named the show The Things We All Carry based off a book. And that book is called The Things They Carried. And it was, uh, it's a, it's a novel set in Vietnam and it's about a platoon and it's about the things that they carried in the war. So a radio, a, a medic bag, a rifle, a, 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 you know, whatever it's, but it also focused on what they carried out after that battle or after that excursion. And those are the more important things. It's the scars. It's the, it's the damage to our psyche. It's the traumas that we carried out after. And so we all carry something into a fire or a medical call, but we all carry that, that, memory out with us so i'd like to ask my guest you know what's an everyday carry that you don't leave the house without and it has to be physical right it has to be a physical no object. it doesn't have to be physical because i, I have I, a two a two-fold answer right it that does not surprise me with yeah, your brain I, brother like you I, again like i'm so bitter about that that book ambush the last time we recorded but <laughs> You, it's funny. You go back to sleep. You go back to to exercise and nutrition. I have been rocking this whoop band for almost two years now. I think. Yeah, I think it's been two oh, years. Oh, you're you're a newbie, man. You're a newbie. But it is one of those things that I'm like, okay, is it charged? A am I good to go? Yeah. And that's not like just me being neurotic. Yeah, that that's that's a given. 
but because I have been trying to place so much more emphasis on sleep, on recovery, and on at least having some sort of baseline. I know it's not as accurate as an EKG. I know it's not like some heart monitor. I know it's not giving me like the end all be all, but at least I have some sort of baseline. So if I wake up and I'm like, I feel like shit. And the whoop is like, nah, dude, you got awesome recovery. I'm like, okay, okay. Like, so maybe this will go away by the morning. Or if I wake up and I'm like, I am ready to rock and roll. And my whoop is like, homie, you are in the red. You got 2% recovery. I'm like, all right, today's going to be a chill day at work. I'm going to just kind of minimize my exposure to, to like high energy things as much as I can. And just going to take my time recovering. And, and that's one of those things that I feel is, is important towards towards that longevity because sleep we, we keep joking about it and we keep talking about it like yeah the the pfas and the carcinogens and the diesel exhaust and you know we have clean cabs etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm convinced that in five ten years we're going to start seeing studies pop up saying that the reason we all have such alarmingly high rates of cancer is because our sleep is completely fucked because yes. we yes. sleep maybe two uninterrupted hours. Like, well, if you combine how much you might sleep at a busy house, it's it might be a combined two hours if you're lucky. And then you come home and you have your side gig or your other job or your family and you get crappy sleep and so on and so forth. Pretty convinced that we're going to see that be one of the biggest triggers of our, of our cancer incidences. So... I'm trying to get ahead of that curve. I'm trying not to get blindsided and I'm trying to optimize for and prioritize that sleep. Whoop is funny. Like you said, it's you, sometimes you wake up and you're like, man, I feel good. And you look at it you're like, what the fuck? 36% recovered. Huh? <laughs> right. And then sometimes you wake up, like you said, you're groggy, but you're in the green and you're like, huh? And you have no idea, but then it's, it's picking up the things that you don't pick up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There's a guy at work who's, Apple Watch told him to check his blood pressure and he ended up having a heart attack. So at least there's this constant thing on my wrist whose entire job is to track my basic vitals and to let me know if something's wrong. So it, it's kind of like that added layer of protection, right? That's the physical. Yeah, and that, that whoop is, is perfect because you don't have to take it off to charge it. Right. And also, dude, for people like us who get easily distracted by screens and and flashing things, that is one less screen that I have to deal with. I could never have an Apple Watch like it's half of the time I want to throw my phone out the window because of how addictive everything in it is. Right. And um, the last thing I would want is a, a wearable constantly bombarding me with even more stuff. Yep. No, I understand. Yeah. All right. So the other thing, what was it? And this has been a change because when, when we chatted, and I'm glad I get to say this because I'm glad I'm growing and changing. When we chatted, I was still in sort of my like crackhead phase where I was still dealing with everything after we lost Nate with, you know, just navigating life and my relationship and, and dealing with, with friends and family. Now I try to like take, before I leave the houses, make sure that I take a... I don't want to say neutral attitude, but a very go with the flow attitude as, you know, the Stoics like to talk about as, you know, I forget who was it that, that talked about being like water, you know, you just conform to whatever container you're put in, right. you just go with it. And I feel that's important to, to take that attitude because home is my safe space, right? We all laugh at those jokes. Haha, do you need a safe space? But this is my sanctuary. This is my castle. This is where I can be unapologetically me and I can be high strung or I can be meditative and chill. And before I leave my place of refuge, I find it very important to take that one second and be like, whatever happens, I'm well equipped. I know what I know. I have trained what I have trained and I am going to do the best to conform because it's so easy to show up to work and get pissed off about all the calls we have to run to, you know, deal with a family member and you're angry because, you know, they're that cranky old boomer type person. Like it's, it's so easy to let all those circumstances beyond our control get to us, especially me. I have a very 
I, I've been working with my temper for my entire life, but I can be a little trigger happy on, on my angry outbursts. So it's important for me to just take that second and set myself up for the day where whatever happens, I just, I just let it do its thing. And at the end of the day, I get to come home. I get to come back to my sanctuary and offload and go offline and deal with my things. Perfect. All right. Book. Give me a book. Suggest it to my audience and your audience. What's what's a, a book you've, you've recently read or, or you want to, you know, just suggest? So I have been in the growth stages for TJ Leather, my side gig, because last year I did the math. I crunched the numbers and I realized that it made a lot more money than I was expecting it to. And I was just haphazardly running that business. So I have been in that business book kick, and I found this dude by the name of Alex Hormozzi. He, I don't know, dude, he's a goat, in my opinion. This dude looks like a homeless man, right? He's wearing a wife beater, a flannel, a long black beard, long black hair, jorts, and Crocs with calf high socks. And he's wearing these clothes while sitting up in front of millionaires explaining to them how he at 32 33 however old he is has been able to take home hundreds of millions a year from his companies but all of that comes from a very very un like innate understanding of of human nature and he's been through trauma he's had the duis the car crashes the family member issues the just complete isolation that comes with business and also like that hopelessness that comes with not knowing what you're going to do next and, and having to dig yourself out of that hole. So he's not some like trust fund kid like this. This dude has been clawing his way out of a lot of self-made holes for many years and his insights on just human psychology and, and how to deal with yourself first, they transcend the whole business side of things. Right. People are going to listen to this and be like, oh, my God, a business book. I don't care. This guy sits around on Twitter and pumps out some of like the biggest truth bombs about how we are as people and what matters in the end. Like he, he talks he talks about mortality more than some of the Stoics do. Right. He says he's like, listen, in one generation, two generations, no one's even going to remember your name. Right. Your life, the most important thing you're dealing with right now is going to be over and nobody's going to care. So whatever decision you think is so hard right now and whatever judgment you think people are passing on you, just don't worry about it because eventually it's all just going to fade. Do what you want right now. Live the life you want to live and don't let those voices of doubt get to you. And that resonates more than any sort of business book ever could. Yeah, learning how to not let the voices of doubt get to you, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. It's, it's very tough. And we, we all go through that, whether you're running a business, whether you are, you know, pulling a headline after just botching a deployment previously, like, or running a medical call that you're like, Oh, my God, what am I doing? Like, we, we all have the, our self doubt is sometimes the loudest voice in out of all the um, out of all the judgment that, that we experience. Or as you well know, releasing the podcast that you're like, well, what are people going to think about this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's but like going back to when you release yours, like you were just so nonchalant about it that, excuse me, I'm like, dude, Stack is like, he's such a legend. He just like launched this and he don't care. Like he's going to piss off people. He's going to make people happy. He's going to make people sad. I'm like, that is the energy I need to channel. And that's brother, like leading up to our launch, I'm like. That's what I'm channeling. That's what it's going to be. We're going to put ourselves out there, completely vulnerable, completely humble. Whatever happens, it will happen. I have no control over it. I'm going to give it as much as I can and just let life do its thing. And I'm glad I did because if it had been for the doubt and if I hadn't seen you just kind of like almost go at it with reckless abandon, I would have still been trying to finish those edits and trying to perfect everything. And we all know that perfect plan is never going to get executed. No, no, it's never going to perfect is not possible. So, um, you know, like I like I, I guess when I'm asked about what I do, I, I like to say that I'm just a 
Yeah. Uh, Basically, I'm just an idiot with a small platform who likes to let people speak into a microphone, and sometimes I talk into it as well. And and sometimes I make sense. Sometimes I sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I botch it completely. Uh, sometimes I get life wrong. Sometimes I get life right. And um, I'm just trying to to muddle through on my own at times, and muddle through with others, and 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 not do too much damage. Well, dude, I'm very glad that this time it was you speaking into the microphone. Because your story is genuinely one of the best ones that I've heard. And you you just bring so much to the table from everything that you've dealt with in life, your your background, your experience, and being that guy who, like I said, like put himself out there and started that conversation and started pissing off the powers that be and changing the status quo. Because I am convinced that thanks to your podcast and thanks to your platform, and the people, your ambassadors, if you will, we have been able to save a life or two because there are people who understand there's help. There are people who understand that the trauma is universal and the recovery can be learned from others. So it's not entirely hopeless. And I, I'm convinced that somebody out there has listened to it and chosen the help versus the gun or the pills. Well, I, I, and I hope so. I, I honestly do. Um, I hear some stories once in a while and I, and I appreciate hearing stories. I hope that if, if what I've put out there and what you and, and 49 other people roughly, because some of these have been repeats, but some of, you know, some of them have been experts as well. And, and if anything I put out there has helped somebody, then it's a win. And that's all I'm looking for. It's definitely been a win. Dude, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It's always a pleasure, and I'm glad I was able to pick your brain and and build a um, a fuller picture of this enigmatic stack figure that I've known for so long. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'll go back to the shadows and just being the voice behind a microphone and a- asking questions once in a while. Right, I'll get a proof of life text here in like a day or two if I'm lucky. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. And, and thanks for letting me do a crossover with you. And like I said, this one will be out next Wednesday, not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday. And and uh, it's number 50 for me, number 10 for you. And I think those are both good milestones. So I like what you're doing, man. Hey guys, TJ here. As always, I want to give a special shout out to those patrons who have so gracefully contributed to our Patreon community. And as a reminder, the Patreon community is just much more than another place to just share information. It's where there are daily workouts, weekly mantra meditations, trainings, pictures, shout outs, obviously, and basically a place for us who are like minded individuals to come together and be amongst friends and amongst people who who feel the same way as we do about the fire service without further ado special shout out for our patrons coley s zach l ryan g shane s andrew a john c and portia p guys and gals thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for helping continue this this venture and for just doing awesome things in the fire service. You are helping to make a difference. You are leaving the fire service better than you found it. Keep getting after it. Keep doing awesome things. Be safe. Talk to you soon. Hey, everyone. It's TJ here from Keep the Promise. As you know, this podcast is all about helping firefighters become more resilient and well-rounded so that they can be a force for good within their fire department and their community. But today, I want to talk to you about something that's just as important and that is supporting firefighters who are going through tough times. When one of our fellow firefighters is off work because they have to go to the Center for Excellence, they have to go to rehab, they have mental health issues, or they have other health issues, it really takes away their support system and it wreaks havoc on their finances and their family's finances. And many times, these brothers and sisters are left to struggle alone away from their support system and the people who love them without the resources they need to recover. That's why I'm setting a bold new goal, and that is to reach 150 total patrons on Patreon so that we can start a fund to help firefighters and their families during these challenging times. 
and I need your help to make it happen. With your support on Patreon, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to firefighter families who are battling things like addiction, depression, and cancer. We're going to help alleviate the financial strain that can come with being away from the fire department so that our brothers and sisters can focus on healing and recovering. Now, reaching 150 total patrons is a big goal, but I believe that we can do it together. And when we do, we'll be able to make a real difference in the lives of those who serve and protect alongside us. So, if you're not already a patron, I invite you to join us today. Head over to joinkeepthepromise.com and sign up today. Again, that is joinkeepthepromise.com. And if you already are a patron, thank you so much for your support. You'll be receiving some exclusive rewards and perks as a way of saying thanks. Together, let's show our fellow firefighters that we've got their back just like they always have ours. Thank you for listening. Let's get started with the episode.